Our next speaker is uh, Andrew Rosenthal, the head of platform at Jawbone, and a lot of what we discussed just now is a perfect segue into the next discussion. Andrew. Pleasure to, uh, to be in front of you. Following Peter is tough because if there were like a revival for the platform community, this would be it, and I literally wanted to say hallelujah. <laughs> and it was awkward, because I feel like if I had, someone else might have agreed with me. So thank you, that yeah, was... And I quoted you, so yeah, well, but <laughs> when you're talking to the Financial Times, they make you sound more intelligent, because they, they write things in English, 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 even if you said them in American English. Um, <laughs> let me close this up. Great, we're just trying to get this up here so that um, you guys have something pretty to look at. I think we're good, hopefully. Um, I'll get started while we're getting that set up. So I'm Andrew Rosenthal, I'm with Jawbone, we're based in San Francisco, I lived in Boston for two years and I never once remember a day where it was this nice out and not humid. So it's awesome to be back. Um, I work in wearable devices, as what most people think. I like to think I work in platform and hopefully I'll be able to convince you at least part of the way. How many of you are wearing a wearable device of some sort? Okay. Um, how many of you have one that's visible? Anybody have one that's not visible? It's surprising. Um, let's see what we're doing here. I did a smaller company before, Massive, before Jawbone called Massive Health. We were just focused on tracking food. So when I came to Jawbone, my mindset was very much, how do we help people track things? But I ended up in a hardware company, which was very surprising to me, because anyone who's done hardware knows it's wildly different. Everywhere from the types of people who are involved, to the tenure at the company, to the pace at which you change things. So the hard thing for me was showing up at a hardware company. The easier thing was focusing on the problem we have been trying to solve from the very beginning for people, which is how do we help them with their goals? If their goals are weight loss, recovering from surgery, um, knowing themselves, sleeping better, and I'll walk you through some of what we're doing. I can just hold the laptop up and show everybody. <laughs> it worked earlier today, I promise. Um, so I'm gonna get started. Jawbone's a company which has been around for 14 years, which is really long for most tech companies. It's certainly not a startup, it's about 500 people. Uh, it's got offices in Pittsburgh, in San Francisco, in the South Bay as well, in Seattle, uh, London, New York. It's a company that's had a reputation since long before I was there for disrupting things through design. Um, anybody had a Bluetooth headset back in the day? Okay, the very first ones Jawbone had long before I was there had a wire on them, they were wired headsets. But the reason that they disrupted things is because they canceled out all the noise around you. The Bluetooth headsets that Jawbone brought out, they were better, but they were also a lot more expensive. But the reason they won in the marketplace is because they just looked so different. The design was compelling that people were willing to pay for them. And they got rid of their old clunky ones with lights that blinked as they talked, and they were the Jawbone one around instead. Um, how many of you listen to music at home or at work? Who plugs in? Keep your phone up if you plug in your phone to your speaker. So two years ago, a year ago, everyone would have kept their hands up. Everyone plugged in. And then Jawbone and others came along and proved that if you just make Bluetooth really simple and easy, and you make it wireless, and you design something really well, people will actually pay more for a speaker, which is effectively, at least initially, effectively just another speaker. Um, and then wearables came along. <laughs> I think we're just the game over. That's fine. Uh, let me know if it comes up, we'll keep going. So then wearables came along, and the team at Jawbone designed this, and it was initially what people thought just a pedometer wrapped around your wrist. And pedometers have been around for a very long time. That wasn't a particularly innovative thing from most people's perspective. But what the, what the team really designed was a computer wrapped around your wrist. Because it wasn't a pedometer. It was a computer, it was something wrapped around your wrist tied to a big, beautiful display in your pocket. I think mine's hopefully in this pocket, with your phone. Um, tied to the algorithms, tied to the, clouds, to the cloud, to everything happening up in the sky. And that's what Jawbone did differently around wearables. Yes, it was design. Yes, it was being in 100,000 points of sale. Yes, it was pops of color. Wow, guys, we need a... Awesome, thank you. Sorry about the delay. No, that's great, thank you very much. <laughs> it's fine, we're good. It's... We got wearables and disruption happening. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. So that was then. There we go. It's, it's a mystery. That was then. That was hardware tied to the algorithm, tied to the cloud, and Jawbone got a lot of great press, and people started to love the product, which was important. But what we've been fighting really hard to do 
is to make the case, this is fascinating to figure out how, <laughs> is to make the case that it's not about hardware. And that's really weird for a company that's been doing the hardware business for 14 years to say, but it's not about hardware. It's about hardware tied to data, tied to software. And that's a pretty high aspiration. There are companies that have made a lot of market cap, been worth a lot in market cap that are great at hardware tied to software. And there are companies that are really, really good at data tied to some software. There are not companies out there at scale that are really good at hardware and data and software. So the aspirations are pretty high. But I want to walk you through how we're looking at platform, and it doesn't really have to do with wearables, unfortunately, if that's what you wanted to hear about. It has to do with experiences and with engagement. So the Jawbone system, you wear it, it helps you sleep better, move more. There we go, wow. It helps you know yourself. It answers questions that you've always wanted to know, like, what can I do tomorrow to be better than I am today? And eat, sleep, and move are really nice vectors around which to start, and that's still our core organizing principle. But I'll show you some of the things we're doing that are wildly different and kind of surprising, I think. So taking a step back from what we do, because this isn't about Jawbone, I wanted to give you our perspective on what we see happening in the market. We see you at the center of everything. But around you, around that wearable, around that hardware, if it's hardware, or the app running on your phone, if that's what it is, we have the ability now with signals and with context to add identity and access, right? Theoretically, you could imagine that the thing on your wrist also lets you pay for something or swipe into a building. And also to add to that a sense of activities, and activities isn't just working out. Activities may be having walked across the river rather than waiting for the Uber. That's an activity, and that's the kind of thing that adds up into something meaningful. So if you get a sense of what's happening and you understand activity, you can start to make recommendations and see change. And of course, underlying all those things are the signals, the biometrics that most people are focused on when they look at the back of the box. Does it measure this? Does it measure that? That stuff's important. But measuring steps, measuring other biometrics, these are tactics. These aren't strategies. At least that's what I want to try to show you today. So at Jawbone, we take all this. We have a belief that with this kind of knowledge, we can get people in a situation where they're tracking. Then we help them understand and then act based on that. And it's a virtuous cycle. It's not just about behavior change. E-commerce has also done quite well when they understand what people are searching for and they understand the problem they're looking for rather than just the vendor. So it's not unique to us, but we focused on using this to drive the decisions we make. So I want to talk to you about behavior change because I spent three years inside a great cognitive behavioral therapy lab doing really good research that, of course, never really got commercialized, which is the reason I got into tech in the first place. But I have deep respect for what academics at MIT and elsewhere have developed when it comes to creating and validating knowledge. And I want to show you some of the things we've done that are helping push things forward. So we wanted to know, of course, not just can we track steps, but can we get people moving more? Can we actually get them to change their behavior? So we reached out to people the Thursday before, the Thursday of Thanksgiving, and we said, you know, happy Thanksgiving if you're in the US. A lot of our users are global, but for the ones in the US, happy Thanksgiving. By the way, this Thursday tends to be really bad for people. They sit, they eat, they talk to their family. Now, those are good things overall, but if you're focused on getting in steps, they're really, really bad. So all we did is say to one group, Thursdays tend to be good for you. You usually get 7,328 steps. This Thursday could be bad. Watch out. We didn't tell them what to do. The other half, we just said, happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy your turkey. Um, and people love that, too, because we measure engagement. And it's amazing what people will love and share with their friends when their app is talking to them. But for the people for, for whom we said, don't let this Thursday be any different than other Thursdays, they actually walked more. They literally took more steps. Now, that's really cool, because at the end of the day, behavior change is pretty hard. Design makes it easier. But getting it right is hard. And getting it right at scale in a replicable way is very difficult. When it comes to sleep, we did the impossible. We got people to bed earlier. And that's really hard for people that are looking at their screens for guidance throughout the day. But it turns out that nights when my fiance is in town, if I'm up late working, she'll say, Andrew, are you going to stay up late tonight or are you going to come to bed? And I'm probably more likely than not to say, I'll finish this stuff in the morning. When she's out of town, it's a free for all. I'm up late working. I'm trying to get through things. I'm trying to finish stuff up. That's human relationships. That's messy stuff. It's not technology. But we took technology and we asked, how can we productize those kinds of learnings? And we actually built a prompt in the app that asks you, tonight, given your previous history, trying to hit your sleep schedule, our knowledge of your data, tonight, are you willing to try to get to bed at a certain time? And we, we call it a today I will. And today I will is a little pledge that you don't have to answer, but you can choose to. And for people who chose, 
to accept that today I will around sleep. They got to bed 23 minutes earlier. And that's actually huge if you think about data at scale. Now, unlike all the sleep research out there, which is world class and funded by hundreds of millions of dollars of NIH and other money, we didn't do this on a 20-person study or a 400-person study. We did it on a 40,000-person sample size, and we replicated it. So these are the types of things that happen when you have access to a platform for behavior change. Now, this is obviously, like I said, preaching to the choir, but platforms involve assembling the right resources and making them accessible, not trying to own every last bit of it. And one of the key resources for a behavior change platform is computational power. Another one is simply masses of data if you're trying to understand people at scale. But finally, it's the people. It's having access to people, because everybody's special and messy and unique. And as soon as you try to generalize, you lose some of the ability to actually change. And I'll explain why. So it's truth here. It's accepted on the sixth floor of the Media Lab on the 25th of July <laughs> that platforms always win. But there are some people that don't believe that. But here we know that's the case. I want to walk you through some of the stuff that's actually happened, though, around behavior change and data, because there's a lot of junk out there. And I was in the space of apps that try to get you to track your food and eat better. Don't get me wrong. There's good work. But at the end of the day, you get apps. If you search for sleep in the App Store or the Google Play Store, you will get loads and loads of apps, many of which are backed by research. And much of that research is quite good. In fact, much of that research has led to people getting posters or getting grants or even giving a keynote at a medical conference. And if you actually peel it back, much of that research is phenomenally well validated and replicated. Because there are people who are trained as academics to produce knowledge and validate it. And they have an amazing system to do it. The old way of doing it is putting people in a sleep lab, watching them sleep, intervening, watching, and seeing if it changes anything. But if you're trying to help regular people out and about with their own issues sleep, monitoring somebody in a sleep lab for three nights at a cost of $6,000 is not generalizable. It may work to a great degree of replicability and validity to a certain sample size, but the errors we make as we try to do behavior change at scale is to generalize up from things that work for a narrow population. So I'm going to show you why I think that's a problem. The thesis is that platforms always win at behavior change. And this is kind of hard to say as someone who came out of a lab where we focused on trying to make people resilient and happier and less depressed and less anxious by carefully validating things in one environment and then trying to replicate them out. So behavior change works from my perspective. And at Jawbone, when you get the right stuff, the right solution to the right person at the right time. It's not rocket science to say that, but it's hard to do. And if you think about it, we look at things in terms of a pyramid. And, and, and Marshall actually came and joined us about a month ago and sat with the company talking through platforms and how platforms win. And you know something's been successful when the engineers start using that as evidence to challenge decisions and prioritization. And that's exactly what happened in the month after Marshall left. So this really resonated with our team. So again, platforms always win, truth. Platforms are necessary for winning behavior change. And I think I'll show you why. When it comes to behavior change and getting people to do things differently, there are a lot of levels at which one can play. The soda tax was actually a really phenomenal way to get people to stop consuming the same number of cheap calories in New York City, same as taxing cigarettes. It works. We know that it works, and it's replicable. But that's, that's mass market. That's literally taking a blunt instrument and just changing something. Behavior change is, like I said, the right solution to the right person at the right time. So you level up from there, and you think about exercise guidelines, federal guidelines. In spite of what we say about nutrition guidelines, and the reality is Americans think it's more difficult to make sense of a nutrition label than it is to do their taxes. That's true. So in spite of what we think about nutrition guidelines, they actually do shift people's behavior. So you, you legislate something with tax that affects everybody. Nutrition guidelines, people have to be more open to them. You have to be a certain size store or restaurant to report out your caloric findings. It's not one size fits all, but it is still a broader instrument. And it works. It may actually make it so that really calorie rich, uh, bad for you food is either less accessible or at least more visible and understandable in the context of things. But as you level up in UK, we took care of the soda tax. We're trying to get people to eat healthier. How do we get the right person, the right thing to the right person at the right time for the ultimate amount of behavior change? You then meet with a nutritionist or a physician, and she tells you, listen, for your diet, for your goals, you need to eat more of this and less of that. That's actually really effective as well. Again, hard to scale, hard to access, but it's really effective. But that nutritionist, on the best day, maybe seeing eight or nine patients. 
and I tried to see one recently. It was a mess. I tried to get it reimbursed. and It ended up costing me $200 out of pocket, and we only got in one session, and I think we needed to have 10 for me to have the aha moment about what to actually eat differently. So it works, but it's not as easy, and it's not as targeted as needed. So as you move up this pyramid, the question becomes, what's going to work at the very top? How are you going to target? How are you going to select? Now, this is not a question unique to behavior change or unique to, to wearables. There are actually some other people out here that have asked this question. You look at the Netflix prize. Fundamentally, the Netflix prize was a matching solution, a matching assignment, right? Can we match? Can we make a recommendation for Brian, which is a better recommendation by at least 10% compared to what the other algorithm did before, compared to what Cinematch? Netflix put a million, million dollars behind it, and teams from 186 countries, thousands of teams three years later, were able to beat that by just over 10%. It was a triumph for science, and it was about matching and recommendations. This is ultimately what the map looked like. Um, I can't make sense of this, but it's a cool looking image, so I figured I'd use it. <laughs> There's other matching algorithm questions that we've sought to solve with science. IBM's Watson project is all about, at least when it comes to cancer and medicine, all about making sense of masses of data to make the right recommendation for the right person at the right time. And Watson, which is always this weird concept because Watson's a thing that sits in a place but then gets used in other places for other things. So I don't know exactly where Watson is at this moment, but I know that Watson consists of 95 processors, so 95 boxes with over 1,200 processors. And get this, 16 terabytes of RAM. 16 terabytes of RAM. So three years for Netflix, million dollars, 186 countries, thousands of teams. Watson, a huge investment. And what Watson was trying to do was simply to get better than a clinician at taking all this open source, open-ended stuff and making sense of it. So looking at what is effectively a, a case write-up that a physician, a clinician might see, trying to code for things in it, and ultimately trying to make a recommendation, trying to match a diagnosis with a patient. It's really hard. And if IBM that has been doing this for years, if Netflix, which had put a million dollars behind it, if it takes them an army of an open platform and an army of people working on things to do it, how can any one behavior change app actually be the right solution to reducing diabetes for, um, for the average person or for getting somebody moving from the couch to 5K? It's ludicrous to think that there's one solution, yet there are countless companies out there pitching here in Boston and up and down Sound Hill Road saying they have the solution for health problems. They've got the solution for behavior change. And I was one of them. And it's, it's, it's a long, it's a far reach. So at Java, what we did is we put together a platform. And thinking to the platform theory that we've been talking about all day, we assembled a bunch of resources. We made them frictionless in terms of how accessible are they. We kept a very, very high bar for quality, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And we let people run with them. I mean, yes, the Jawbone Up is a wonderful system that you buy out of the box. It measures your sleep. It measures your steps. It helps you understand yourself and live better. And it works out of the box. It's a beautifully integrated experience that we you know, build most, or if not all of that. But at the same time, coexisting with this beautiful integration, it is an open platform on which people can do whatever they want. And the most interesting things happening on our platform that are driving change are not the usual things about sleep and steps that you might expect. And I want to show you some. So, so far, so good? Platforms, pyramids, our belief is it's got to be open. There have to be a lot of different solutions to try to drive behavior change. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so the best thing about going toward the end of the day is everybody's already introduced these different companies, so there's no kind of context setting. Nest, obviously great. It's, you know, someone talked about it being the, the hub, the future of the home. The Nest thermostat, which is one of the products out there now, can control your home, can understand when you're home alone, or when there are a lot of people and change the temperature. Understand when you're away or when you're home and change the temperature. Connected to the Jawbone Up, it can now make sure that your temperature in your bedroom is the right temperature for sleep. And that sounds simple, but until the Up came along, sleep was unknowable. Nobody really understood how long it took them to fall asleep, how many times they got up in the night. If they were actually asleep for seven hours, if they went to bed at 1 a.m. and got up at 8 a.m., or once they started measuring, yeah, they tossed and turned, it took them a while. Then they got up a couple times, and a train went by late at night, and you could see them waking up. So sleep was unknowable, then we came along and started measuring it. And it's Jawbone, so we put it in context and helped them understand it. And now with the connection to Nest, if you're getting up because it's too warm in your room, this system could actually start adjusting the temperature and turning it down for you. And of course, since this is the Northeast, if you're about to get up, and we know when you're about to get up given the tracking, we can make sure that the heat is on and the house warms up for you in the morning, which is also pretty helpful. So this is an example of something happening on the platform, which is not traditional health and wellness, but absolutely critical to long-term engagement. 
The next one is one of my favorites because it's a picture of a puppy, so everybody loves this slide. It's a little pixelated, but on the far right is a puppy. The puppy is wearing something around his neck. Does anybody recognize what that is? It's really hard to see, I'm sorry. Yeah, Carlos? It's, it's something, okay, that's good. Uh, it's called the whistle. It's not anything we make at Jawbone. It is a tracker for your dog, and you can laugh now, because it's a tracker for your dog that's as expensive as a tracker for your spouse. Um, but, you bought one? <laughs> okay, so you bought it. Your dog's wearing it now? Because you are fascinated to know if your dog was actually asleep watching TV or running around while you were gone, right? So people, this is fast, people love this stuff and they'll pay for it. And, and that in and of itself is great. That is valuable in and of itself for pet owners. But all of a sudden, Whistle integrated to our platform and now when you go for a walk with your dog, that data comes into the up system and we understand that you got those steps because of walking with your dog. Now that's really cool, especially for engagement in an app when you see pictures of your friend's dogs. But imagine if we're not here, but we're over at MGH, and we're in a diabetes lab, and we're a health coach, trying to coach people to change their behavior. Saying to someone, walk, you know, park at the far end of the parking lot and walk in, and the average person gets 800 steps is generalized. It's not specific enough. Saying to someone, well, it's beautiful out during the summer, you should walk more in the summer, generalized. Now, if you knew the exact weather and the fact that they had plenty of time before their first meeting, maybe you could recommend that. Technology can help. But context opens whole new doors. Imagine being able to say to someone, I don't know your name, sorry. Sam. Sam. Listen, Sam, you tend to be 900 steps under your goal around 8 p.m. And we do that right now at Java, and we fire people information saying that you're this far from your goal, go for a walk, you're likely to hit it. Imagine if we said, Sam, the dog hasn't been walked, and every time you, you walk the dog, you get your 900 steps in. That's the kind of stuff which really allows us to start doing behavior change on the platform. And the only way this ever would have happened was by opening this up, because who would have ever thought to go do business development with a dog tracking company? Automatic. We're moving further and further away from health. This is familiar to anybody? Okay, so automatic, people have them. You put it in your car, any car from 1998 or onward has the ability to plug in something to your computer and understand your driving patterns, which is actually really cool. So if you're driving, the things people tend to care about is wasting money on gas, or being a poor driver, especially if you've got kids at home. So automatic gives you a whole view, and of course, all these companies are based in San Francisco, so their screens obviously show them like in the Mission District and driving up and down, raising money. <laughs> if you're raising money on the East Coast, you should change your screens. But <laughs> automatic will tell you how much money you wasted on gas by poor driving. it. That in and of itself is valuable. But when you connect it to your job on up, it'll actually tell you how many steps you lost by driving fewer, by driving two miles or less. So this puts it in context. In and of itself, these things are relevant. They have their own business, their own value created. But we built a platform to allow people to create value on top of what we have. We've opened up almost all of it. There's some we hold on to dearly. And we've applied a very, very high bar for, bar for quality. So we've got thousands of developers worldwide, but there are about 25 right now that we're featuring because we think that they open up experiences that are remarkable. So there's no good behavior change solution there are only good behavior change solutions. Fundamentally, that's what we found. That's the secret of our platform, that there's no one size fits all. There are things we own and will continue to refine, like helping people make sense of sleep. But we will also look for partners to plug in and build value on top of that, because this isn't about hardware. It's not about sensors being packed onto the body. That's necessary for getting the data in, but there's plenty of other ways now coming up where you can start to pull in data. It's about making sense of it all and helping people actually change behavior. And that's the way we're gonna be judged at Jawbone. We're gonna be judged on people using our product day in and day out, month in and month out. Right now, if I leave my apartment and my house and my iPhone's there, I'm gonna go back in and get it. I don't think we're at that point yet for everybody with wearables. I don't think we're at that point yet for everybody with these behavior change solutions. But by becoming part of your everyday life, not just about data and about health, by having access or payments, by having information about your dog's health by understanding your driving patterns, we become something which is truly integrated. We become a platform which truly fades into the background and helps people solve problems, as opposed to just a product on the wrist. So at Jawbone, we believe that health is what happens in between doctor visits, and the biggest impact we can make is helping people make sense of the thousand steps, the thousand little things that happen every day, because that's where we can make a real difference. So thank you, guys. Do we have time for questions or great?
convinced that we needed to make it approachable to track steps and make sense of them. We had our app on iOS, and then we eventually brought it out on Android. And people loved it, and they talked about it. And then, internally, we started building out a platform, but we didn't say it like that initially. We just started bringing on some partners that allowed you, if you went on a bike ride, to automatically have your bike ride show up. Or if you were logging calories somewhere else or stepping on a scale to have it automatically showed up. Very tightly curated. Then as we opened up the platform, we then started explaining to people, this is a set of APIs. You can, they're carefully defined, but you can do whatever you want within the limits of those definitions as long as the user is okay with it. There is a bank in Russia that we only found out about it because of the advertising they were doing. And the bank in Russia was struggling to figure out how to attract customers who were gonna give it money for its savings account. And they, of course, want to attract customers that are a certain type of customer. So they took out ads, and they built a beautiful video, and it's in Russian, but it's been translated, so I think it's accurate, and it says that the true wealthy is healthy. And every day one of their customers takes 10,000 steps or more, some of her money is moved from one savings account to one with a higher interest rate that is only accessible by connecting your jawbone up and taking the 10,000 steps. So that's the magic of platform that we're so excited about. Thanks. I think we're, I think we're good? Great, thanks guys.